So I'm going to talk about infrared photothermal heterodyne imaging, and this is really from a materials perspective. So I, you've seen a lot of talks today, mostly on the bio side. I'm going to be more on the materials side. So I'm from Notre Dame, and I'm going to start out kind of like uh, Johan this morning with a little bit of history, but I won't be very long. This whole area of ultra sensitive, you know, high spatial resolution microscopy, spectroscopy started with W. E. Murner back in 1989, and he's basically doing an absorption experiment on a single pentacene molecule in paraterphenol at low temperature. And as you can probably guess, that's a fairly hard experiment. So that came out in this PRL. And then folks like Michelle, Reit, and others re realized very soon afterwards that, you know, why do a hard experiment when you can look at the emission? It's essentially a zero background experiment, and you can basically get single molecule res resolution. So ever since 1990, anyone doing single molecule type or single particle type experiments, you're probably doing a single, sorry, an emission based experiment. But as you can probably guess, I'm going to go back to absorption. And the reason for that, as most folks here already know, is that if you're looking at something emissive, one, it's got to be emissive. Two, it better have a high emission quantum yield. Three, it shouldn't blink unless you're doing STED or something like that, or, or sorry, a super resolution. It shouldn't really blink, and then it shouldn't photo bleach. And then beyond that, there's a whole bunch of materials that are not really emissive. And so as far as you're concerned, you can't apply single molecule techniques to look at them. So if you really want it to be general and look at things, uh, you want a different technique. And so we want to go back to absorption. Now, if you wanted to do sensitive absorption experiments, there's a number of ways today that you can approach this problem. And so on this slide, what I'm showing you here is work that's been developed by guys like Michelle Arit and Bram Lunas and, um, I don't know, Fabrice Vallée and others, where you're going to do something called photothermal heterodyne imaging or PHI. The basic idea here, for those who are not familiar with this, is you're going to heat your particle or object of interest. You're going to have a laser, in this case a visible laser, on resonance with an electronic transition. It could be a plasma on resonance, it could be something else. An electronic transition of the species of interest. The thing absorbs light and then it recombines non-radiatively. When it does that, the, the particle's temperature changes and there's a corresponding change more or less in the refractive index of the material. You can sense that change of refractive index using a second laser. In this case, it's a red laser here, shown here. And you can do this experiment in either a transmission geometry or a reflection geometry. Now, the prototypical system that folks use in this area are gold nanoparticles. So here are some images of gold particles from this work by Brom Lunas. And again, you can clearly see individual gold particles. Now, beyond that, you can also demonstrate single molecule sensitivity, and that's been done by uh, Michelle Arit. Now, in addition to photothermal heterodyne imaging, there are alternate techniques that, for example, we have also been pursuing, and that includes spatial modulation spectroscopy or microscopy, where the general idea is that you got your particle at the center of a tightly focused laser beam, and you're going to modulate the position of the sample in and out of that tightly focused laser beam. And every time the particle is within the tightly focused beam, it attenuates the intensity of that light ever so slightly. And because we're doing this in a periodic fashion, we can use lock-in detection. And if you run the numbers, you'll see here in this expression that this AC term has a, has a prefactor that's proportional to the extinction cross-section of the particle. And as you already know, this value is frequency dependent. And if you have a tunable laser and you tune it across the different, you know, the spectrum, you're able to map out the absorption spectrum or extinction spectrum of your particle or object of interest. So we've demonstrated this on gold nanoparticles, and you can see some examples of the images that you can get. It has a slightly different double lobe structure because you're modulating in and out of the beam. You can do absorption on individual 13, 25, 30, 40 nanometer particles, or even something as small as an 8 nanometer particle shown here. With a better auto balance detector, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, you can probably go down to 5, five nanometers. All right, so next, if you, oh, let me stay here for a little bit. If you look at the absorption spectra or extinction spectra, and let's assume that the gold particle is representative of some object or general object of interest. 
you'll note that the transitions are fairly broad, right? Many nanometers wide. And so consequently, electronic transitions in the visible part of the spectrum are usually fairly broad and they don't have chemical specificity. So for example, if folks really wanna know the chemical identity of something, unless you exactly know you're looking at, in this case, at a gold particle, I could confuse this for something else, right? In principle. So we want a chemically specific absorption imaging and spectroscopy technique. Now, how do you do that? Well, to do that, you have to move out of the visible and into the mid infrared where you have this chemical fingerprint region where you have chemically specific vibrational transitions in the case of molecules. So let's move out into the mid infrared. So when you do that and you wanna do an absorption experiment today, what you're probably gonna do is use an FTIR microscope. And on this slide, you can see a commercial instrument from Brooker. And you can already read here that it's got some pros, but the main disadvantages of the technique, apart from the low sensitivity, is its poor spatial resolution. As you've already heard many times during this lecture series or the seminar, basically you have the diffraction limit that you're fighting against. And yes, there's ways to circumvent it, but basically this means that you're restricted here to lambda over two. So here I'm showing you the image of a calibration grid from Edmund Scientific, and you can see, don't ignore the time, you can see that we're gonna be limited in the mid infrared to a spatial resolution of something like five microns. So this is unfortunately not very good, and you'd like to beat this infrared or mid-infrared diffraction limit. So on this next slide, I'm gonna show you some ways that people have circumvented this problem. By the way, are there any questions that I can answer really quick? Because unfortunately, I don't know how to use Teams, and so I don't know what's going on in terms of, you know, are there reactions or questions that I can address? No, okay, I'll keep going. So on this slide, what I'm showing you here are some images of alternate mid-infrared absorption techniques with super resolution or below mid-infrared diffraction limit resolution. They have some fancy acronyms, but they basically fall under apertured and apertureless near-field optical microscopies or scanning probe-based approaches. If you look at the figure, right, and obviously I have the pros and the cons listed here with the cons bigger than the pros, You'll notice that there's a synchrotron here. Okay, you need a very bright light source in order to do some of these experiments like IR SNOM or SINS, which is a, another technique which is based on basically the same thing. So it requires complex instrumentation. And additionally, and this is just my personal bias, I've never been a fan of the feedback loops involved in near uh, scanning probe approaches and you crash your tip and there's a lot of problems with that. So we wanna avoid this in principle. If you have access to a very good TEM with a monochromatic electron beam, right? Something that you would find at a national laboratory, then you can do what's called STEM EELS, where EELS stands for electron energy loss spectroscopy. And in this way, you can get the mid infrared chemically specific absorption spectra of some object of interest. But again, at the cost of having to go to a national lab, unless you're at a very nice institute with, with a lot of money. So together with Greg Hartland, we've developed this al alternate technique. It's a tabletop mid-infrared super resolution imaging technique called infrared photothermal heterodyne imaging. And if you remember my earlier slides, this is nothing more than photothermal heterodyne imaging using a mid-infrared laser instead of a visible laser. So we're using a mid-infrared OPO or quantum cascade laser that's tunable with a tuning range, say, from, say, a 1040 wave numbers to 4,000 wave numbers. And the idea, just like visible PHI, is that we're going to come in where the intensity is either modulated or it's a pulsed laser. You're going to come down and heat your sample. And because it's being heated periodically, its refractive index will more or less change in a periodic manner. And you can sense that change in refractive index with a second probe laser. So I'm showing on this slide a 532 probe laser coming in from the bottom. Let me come back to this geometry in a minute, but this is a counter-propagating pump probe geometry. This laser was a CW laser. And here on the left of this diagram, you can see it comes in CW and there's a modulation transfer because of that periodic change in refractive index. The light that's reflected has this sort of periodicity to it, 
and we can detect that using lock-in detection. And by tuning the wavelength of the mid-infrared pump and looking at the lock-in signal, we can basically map out the infrared or mid-infrared absorption of an individual object. Okay, coming back to the uh, counter-propagating geometry, you can see here that we're going to use a refractive objective where the numerical aperture can be very large. Consequently, the spatial resolution that one can achieve with this technique is limited by the visible diffraction limit, not the mid-infrared diffraction limit. So with this tabletop technique, you have a spatial resolution on the order of, say, 300 nanometers. On this next slide, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about IRPHI very quickly. Now, we'd like to claim that we're the first to do this, but we're not. The credit really should go to some Koreans. And unfortunately, they published an APL and they uh, unfortunately undersighted a publication where for whatever reason they decided to look at balsamic oil droplets in water. Okay. And by using their homemade laser, they were able to tune the laser infrared pump to 20, uh, 2850 wave numbers so that they could look at the CH2 symmetric stretch of the oil. They could then tune off resonance to the 3333 wave numbers to look at the OH stretch of water. And you can see here in panels A and B on the left, the chemically specific imaging that they were able to achieve back in 2009. Spectral fidelity, that is, how good IRPHI reproduces your conventional FTIR spectrum, is shown here in the far right, where you can see an image from the U.S. Naval Research Lab, where, as the, as the name suggests, they're interested in things like explosives. The solid line is the FTIR spectrum of TNT. The solid red symbols and line is the corresponding IRPHI signal of TNT. And they're probably trying to do this in a standoff detection manner, that is, in a very macroscopic distance. So you can see that there's a good agreement between the spectra, and so IRPHI exhibits spectral fidelity. Next, on this slide, super resolution was first shown by this professor at Jixing Chen, formerly at Purdue University in Indiana, now at BU. It's not Bangor University, it's Boston University here in the States. And what Jixing showed is using a quantum cascade laser and a single 500 nanometer diameter polymethyl methacrylate bead, he could image the bead one point at a time, and then if you take a line scan across of it, you can see that the achieved spatial resolution was something like 600 nanometers. Now here at Notre Dame, Greg and his student Jeremy showed back in 2017 that you can look at a 100 nanometer diameter polystyrene particle, and if you take a cross-sectional line scan through that, the achieved spatial resolution is something like 300 nanometers. And the reason why Notre Dame beats BU apart from football, right, uh, is the fact that we're using this counter-propagating scheme where you have a high numerical aperture refractive objective to focus this light to a very tight diffraction limited spot. Okay, so now we can get 300 nanometer spatial resolution. Jixing Chen is not done. He comes back and says, well, I can do super resolution mid-infrared imaging and wide field imaging. And what he's done here in these images is he's got polymethyl methacrylate on a substrate. It could be a silicon substrate. I don't remember. He somehow e-beam etched some letters. I don't know why he chose MIP. And then by doing this hot, cold subtractive scheme on his CCD camera, He's able to look at 1728 wave number absorption in a wide field modality. You can clearly see the etched out letters, MIP, whereupon the spatial resolution that he's achieved is, say, 500 nanometers. The chemical specificity is again highlighted here, where you have three polymethyl methacrylate beads. You can image at 1728 wave numbers uh, on resonance and see the particles. And if you move off resonance, you have 1808, you don't see the particles anymore. So we now have super resolution image, both in the confocal kind of scheme or sort of one point at a time scheme, as well as wide field. The current state of the art IRPHI I'm suggesting is on this slide in terms of its sensitivity or limit of detection and in terms of the spatial resolution and spectral fidelity. So what, what we're seeing here are data from this publication where what we have here are individual polystyrene beads, 100 nanometer diameter, 150 nanometer diameter individual polymethyl methacrylate beads, 
imaged at different frequencies or resonant frequencies. Spectral fidelity is shown below where you can see the solid red line is the infrared spectrum of a single bead and the corresponding ensemble FTIR spectrum is shown with a dashed blue line. Again, good spectral fidelity. The gist or bottom line of this slide is if you look down here into the box, our limit or estimated limit of detection based on our signal to noise ratios is something like 10 to the minus 14 square centimeters. For guys like Johan and others doing single molecule, you're used to numbers like 10 to the minus 15 square centimeters or minus 16 square centimeters for a single molecule. For an infrared vibrational transition, this is still far away from single molecule, but it's close to a single nanoparticle or nano object. And so we can probably do single nano object mid infrared spectroscopy. And with improvements and refinements to the technique, we can probably lower this number a little bit more. So now you're probably asking to yourself, right? This is the obvious question. Well, Ken, this is very nice, but what really is the origin of the IRPHI signal contrast? You've suggested to me in the last few slides that it's refractive index changes. But, you know, my intuition tells me that there might be some other contributions. And you're absolutely right. There are other contributions. And what I'm showing you here are simulations from Greg Hartland. We're using ComSol. He's simulated the IRPHI response of an individual bead. And you're seeing on the far left the movie that, that shows how the refractive index of the bead changes upon irradiation with an intensity modulated infrared source. But what you're also seeing on the right is a movie that shows you how the, the physical size of the particle changes upon absorption of the infrared light. As the particle heats up, it expands and it cools, heats, cools, and so forth. And so consequently, there's at least two contributions to the IRPHI signal. And that has a complex interplay uh, or dependency between both that's shown here in these open, uh, sorry, closed symbols on the far right. So my point is that there's at least two contributions to the IRPHI signal. Now, on this next slide, we've since done some analytical modeling, where the analytical modeling is of the backscattering cross-section of an individual bead. And when we do that, we account for two contributions to the backscattering cross-section. The first that relates to the refractive index change with temperature, the second that relates to the size or physical size change with temperature. You're going to note in your mind that these two terms have an opposing sign. There's a sign difference between them. As the particle gets larger, the refractive index is going to get smaller and vice versa. Okay? So these are actually fighting each other, if you will. Now, cutting a long story short, and all the details can be uh, found in this uh, JAP manuscript, the experimental data for individual polystyrene or polymethyl methacrylate beads, whether you're imaging it on resonance at 3030, 1450, and so forth, is shown here in open symbols. And then the simulated or analytical solution is shown here in the dashed blue and dashed red lines. And you can see that there's fairly good agreement or it's near quantitative agreement between the two. Okay, next. If you look at this cross-sectional, uh, sorry, backscattering cross-section expression a little more carefully, there's some nice things that the analytical modeling tells you. I've color-coded the first term blue, the second term red. Please remember that. So the refractive index term in blue, you'll see for most sizes, dominates. This is the dominant term, and it goes back to sort of the general easy or hand-waving explanation for IRPHI. I hit the particle or object with my laser, it gets hot, the refractive index changes. So this again proves that or at least corroborates that sort of hand wavy argument. The physical size change in red is shown here and you can see that for the most part it stays below the refractive index contribution, but in some circumstances there's a crossover at small sizes. Now, this crossover depends upon the refractive index of the surrounding medium. And so if you look on this slide, <clears throat> we can look at that dependency. This slide is very convoluted, I apologize. But if you look at the slide, the blue is on top of the red. That seems to be true. 
at small sizes, there's a tendency to try to cross over. If you focus on these black arrows on the far left, as the refractive index of the surrounding medium increases, those two lines, the blue and the red, split apart. That's important because that's going to increase the contrast or IRPHI signal. And so the take home message from the analytical modeling is that if you want to go and do a very, very small particle, then what you should do is not use air or some vacuum or some, you know, low index surrounding medium. You should increase the refractive index of the surrounding medium to get a better signal to noise ratio. So that's how one would propose to do uh, IRPHI experiments on small things in the future. So now with the remaining time, I'm going to quickly go through a whole bunch of systems where we've demonstrated using IRPHI for real life things. And so folks like Stefano, who's in the audience, I hope, and listening, uh, we all know perovskites are cool, right? And so hybrid perovskites are the coolest things since sliced bread because they make fantastic solar cells. They're cheap, they're solution processed. But nothing is free in life, and we all know that there's problems with the hybrid perovskites, okay? So for those not familiar with these materials, it has a stoichiometry ABX3. A is a monovalent cation, and shown here in red is the fact that they're organic cations. So it could be methyl ammonium or formamidinium. And as you already guessed, we have infrared sensitivity to these different cations, so we can actually monitor those cations specifically. B is a divalent cation, it tends to be lead. X is a monovalent anion, it'll tend to be iodine or bromine. This is the crystal structure, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but you can basically get different crystal structures depending upon the tilting or lack of tilting of these halide octahedra. The cubic phase is what you want for a solar cell. So next, when folks actually go out and make solar cells, they're gonna use mixed halide systems like formamidinium, methyl ammonium, and sometimes triple cation cesium uh, systems where you have cesium in it. The reason is empirically it's just more stable, right? I won't go into the details of why that is other than that's empirically observed. Now, when people solution process these materials, there's the implicit assumption that, hey, I take my solution precursors, I mix it together, I spread it or spin coat it onto a substrate, it's exactly the same composition everywhere across the active layer of my solar cell. And the question is, is that true? And from the context or sort of the expression that I have, you can probably guess it ain't true. And so if you use IRPHI to go across the active layer of say a solar cell and look at the form of medinium to methyl ammonium concentrations or ratios across the active area, you're gonna see heterogeneity in this plot. And this IRPHI plot says, in fact, the local composition of this material is changing. And um, by the way, we're looking at the 1710 CN stretch of form of medinium here and the 1465 NH3 band of methyl ammonium. Sorry, I, I forgot to, to mention that. So now you might say, hey, Ken, that's great. I'm glad you saw that there's heterogeneity, but so what? My solar cell works. Well, the problem is that open circuit voltages actually depend upon the composition through the band gap of the material. The band gap of the material is gonna change with local composition. Your solar cell ain't working the way you think it works. And so we can actually go and quantify what those changes would be. Ignore panel A, that's just a bunch of analytical chemistry. Panel B is the IRPHI ratio map. Panel C is what the corresponding local composition of this material is in terms of X. X is this number here. And what you see is that there's 20% variations across the active layer, and so you have band gap changes across this area of the film. And the reason that matters is if you do a correlated band gap to local stoichiometry plot shown here, we're using the emission maximum as a proxy for local band gap, you can see that there's this inverse correlation where regions that are formamidinium rich have a lower band gap than regions that are methyl ammonium rich, which have a higher band gap. And this corresponds to the bulk band gaps of formamidinium lead iodide and methyl ammonium lead iodide. The take home message is that open circuit voltages uh, link, to the op link to the band gap of these materials, and you're gonna have big variations of your open circuit voltage and your solar cell ain't working the way you think it should work. So that's the first message. The second message is the reason why you don't have perovskite solar cells on your roof 
on your car, on your clothing, is because these things, they fall apart. The main reason they fall apart is because they have moisture instabilities. The second reason, and perhaps the more insidious reason there's a problem with perovskites and they're not commercial, is they have an intrinsic instability. If you shine light on these things or you apply an electrical bias, the anions and the cations move. Okay, that's bad. You don't want your material evolving as a function of time. I don't have time today to talk about light-induced anion segregation. That's a completely different talk. I will say that with IRPHI, we can actually test whether the cations of these materials move. And as you're already seeing in the slide, they move. So this bias-induced cation migration is thought to be the origin of hysteresis in perovskite solar cells and linked to its degradation as well. You can make lateral devices where I have formamidinium cesium, lateral devices between two electrodes, or triple cation systems, formamidinium methyl ammonium and cesium between two electrodes, apply a bias, and using IRPHI, which is chemically specific, look at the formamidinium ratio before and after, or the formamidinium ratio before and after, and the methyl ammonium ratio before and after, and through the line scans shown here, you can see that there's a pileup on the side closest to the negative electrode and a depletion on the side closest to the positive electrode. Now, we haven't done these in a stop motion manner, but in principle, you could do that to actually get things like the migration activation energies and mobilities of these cations under, uh, under bias. So we can look at instabilities of hybrid perovskites using cation-specific infrared imaging. Quickly, chemically complex systems, environmental applications. Uh, we can look at road dust in South Bend, Indiana. And so this is more of an analytical chemistry application with some colleagues in civil and environmental engineering. You can look at different transitions related to styrene from tires, fuel additives, things in tires and corrosion inhibitors and so forth. Again, I just wanna highlight the fact that we're chemically specific. And then I'm gonna end, because I don't know how much time I have left, with something on plasmonics. And my colleague, Greg Hartland, is the expert on this, so I'll defer any hard questions. I'll have you ask Greg all the hard questions on plasmonics. But my understanding on plasmonics is that it's a pretty hot area. And we all know gold nanoparticles has a plasmon, have a plasmon resonance around 530-ish nanometers. The Roman Lycurgus cup is one example. Michael Faraday studied gold uh, nanoparticles looking at the plasmon resonance basically. And what people want to do with this is things like SIRS or other more complicated plasmonic uh, tech, um, applications, excuse me. The problem with looking at visible plasmonics is that there's these large ohmic losses in the visible. There's an idea that if you move into a different spectral region, you'll have less ohmic losses and a better prospect for realizing the promise of plasmonics, okay? But how do you tune the plasmon resonance of a metal? You can't change the electron density because that's fixed. Okay, so we're, we're, we have a problem there. You can change the size and aspect ratio of a particle. So Greg has shown here back in 2011 that you can change the size of a particle and you maybe you can move out to 600 nanometers with your gold particle. You can change the morphology from a rod, excuse me, from a sphere to a rod to a wire, and you can move the resonance out to say 1,000 nanometers. But where you really want to be is you really want to be out and say the mid infrared. How do you do that? Well, you can actually make using EBM lithography these gold nanowires or nano antennas. Okay. And if you make them long enough, like say one to four microns, they're going to have plasmon resonances within them. These are called Faber Perot modes. And you can see, I liken them to standing waves. You can see those uh, resonances here. And in fact, if you do some, something like stem eels, right, this is this electron energy loss spectroscopy, you can actually see the size dependent tuning of those mid infrared plasmon resonances. So you can see this evolution of this feature here with size of the nanowire or length of the nanowire. Okay. Again, this is done using stem eels, which requires an extremely monochromatic source. We've shown that you can now do this on a tabletop using IRPHI. And that's what I'm showing here on this next to last slide. So for different length nanowires, you can see for this M equals three Fabry-Perot mode, you can see the plasmon resonance redshift or go to lower energies with increasing length. 
as you would expect from a simple formula for these Fabry Perot modes, there's an inverse length dependence. For the M equals four mode here, again, there's a redshift with increasing length of the wire. We can own, uh, sorry, we, we can also do imaging of those Fabry Perot modes using IRPHI taking the data one point at a time. And you can see here three, if you squint and if you're forgiving, you can see three peaks here. That's basically those three peaks that you would expect or the features that you would expect in these simulations. Three peaks here and then something akin to four peaks here again, if you're forgiving. Now the reason why these, at least the hand wavy reason why these images are smeared out is IRPHI works upon the accumulation of heat, but if heat dissipates very quickly within these metals, then you're going to start to lose the contrast responsible for IRPHI. And we think at least at a hand wavy level, this is one of the reasons why the features are not as well defined. So if we can modify our technique to capture the first few, the, the, the early time scales after the excitation, then perhaps we can actually resolve these uh, structure, the fabry perot modes better. And then finally, something about the line widths. If you look at the line widths, the line widths range from something like 35 to 70 MeV, right? These, these line widths. That corresponds to dephasing time between 40 femtoseconds and 20 femtoseconds. These are, these are fairly large numbers co compared to a vibrational time scale. And it raises the prospect of using something like what's called SERA, which is surface enhanced infrared absorption spectroscopy, to allow you to look at very, uh, do very sensitive vibrational spectroscopies. Now, beyond that, these life, sorry, these plasma line widths are fairly narrow. That's shown here experimentally. And they're narrow because you have suppressed scattering because of the larger volume of the wires, suppressed radiation damping in the mid infrared because of the lower volume uh, density of modes. And then you also have, in print, well, uh, I'll leave Greg to answer this, decreased confinement of, electric, of the electric field in the mid infrared. The point is that the line widths are narrow, dephasing times are long. And so with that, I think I'm on schedule. I'm gonna end by acknowledging the folks who did this work. These are the students who did the work over the years. Greg, who's in the audience, Ed, and Pavel, who did a lot of the analytical modeling, and the National Science Foundation for fun funding this work. And so with that, I'm going to end. I hope that the presentation has been OK. I'm not used to Teams, and so I apologize if there's any sort of technical issues. <laughs>